Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the fifth of our China Ready webinar series. My name is Laura Markle, and I am the director of the Atlantic chapter of the Canada China Business Council. As you all probably know, if you've been following our series, this is a six part series of webinars uh, focused on providing Canadian companies with the tools and understanding they need to be able to take on the China market. And for today's webinar, we will be discussing IP in China 2020, no longer a barrier to taking on the China market. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Paul Jones, founder of Jones & Company, a law firm specializing in IP and competition issues, who is a firm that is particularly um, known for their experience with litigating in China and has a successful track record for enforcing IP rights in the Chinese courts. In this session, Paul will introduce the structure of the PRC legal system as it applies to intellectual property, such as trademarks, uh, copyrights, industrial designs, patents, and trade secrets, and how you can use it to assess and reduce your risks when entering the market. Paul will review recent cases uh, and uh, handled by his firm, showing that it is possible to track down counterfeiters and that the courts do respond well to well-presented evidence. And also joining us today on this webinar is Yixian Chen, an associate at Jones & Company, who will share with us at the end of the session an overview on the firm and how their team can help support you with your, prote your IP protection requirements. Before we get started, uh, just a reminder again, as you know, um, we will uh, be recording this session and while par participants will be muted, we really hope that you're gonna send in some questions. Uh, again, down at the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we'll try to make as much time as, as usual to, uh, to handle your questions. Otherwise, uh, we'll be sure to get back to you individually. So uh, I would love to welcome Paul to present. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, Lauren. Thank you very much to, uh, for inviting me uh, to do this presentation and then even for inviting us to sponsor it so that Ishan gets on. Um, as Laura mentioned, we've been litigating IP in China for over a decade, and we've not found it to be a barrier. In fact, uh, all right, there's the second slide. I'm starting to get onto it. Here is a slide that we've been using for most of that decade, and in fact, has been used on uh, uh, CCBC presentations before. And it's the same problem. People feel that intellectual property cannot be protected in the PRC. And so they, some of them don't even register. And, and that's quite wrong, as I'll talk about it, or even do business in the PRC. Um, well, is that an accurate representation of how things happen in China? Uh, we'll look at some of the evidence we've accumulated over the years. Um, here's a slide. One of the things is that China has not, in my experience, been had a policy or a, a, a lack of regard for intellectual property. And I just picked out an introduction by the current leader, Xi Jinping, when he came into power, saying that. But long before Xi Jinping uh, came to power, the, I, the attitude that China took in contrast to Brazil or India was that one day China will be the leader in intellectual property or something close, as you may be seeing in the discussions with Huawei and so on, and therefore that they would respect intellectual property rights. Now, has that happened? Um, oh, by the way, here, just to give you an example, this is a slide from about the spring of 2008. And if you can read the sign back there, it says Tsinghua, a science park in, in English. And I was speaking there about the effects of the new anti-monopoly law uh, on intellectual property uh, commercialization. But what's more important is what's in front of me, which is the size of the park. In other words, the type of, you know, you saw Xi Jinping in 2014, here's a slide from 2008. It's been a long time that, uh, that China has considered uh, intellectual property to be important. Okay, so why is there so much counterfeiting? 
And here's a slide that I use regularly, last used in November in, no, in a legal conference, scientific conference in Novosibirsk in Siberia. But it does try to explain it. It's China is undergoing a rapid change. It's sort of a land rush economy. And in that, there's all sorts of people trying all sorts of strategies to, to advance themselves. It's happened before. The book from which this quote is taken is a nation of counterfeiters. What country? That's the United States it's talking about. In the first hundred years after the revolution, there was no Federal Reserve, there was no government agency that issued currency. The banks did it individually and counterfeiting was rampant. The writer is a professor of history at Duke University in Carolina and it's published by Harvard University Press. What I'm trying to say is that the counterfeiting problem is very real and much disliked in China, but it's part of a society undergoing a tremendous change. There's more to the compliance too. The society, this is a traditional Chinese saying, and it has two things that I, why, two reasons it's up here. Shanggao Huangdiyuan, the mountains are high and the emperor is far away, is an old saying about the problem of the Chinese emperor trying to govern all of the immense territory of China. It's also in reverse, it shows one of the key issues in China that's opposite from us. We often talk about things as lawyers, as the Magna Carta and the devolution of the absolute uh, power of the king to a constitutional monarchy and so on. China has the other view, the opposite view. In China, good times are known when there's centralized power. So there are some tricky parts to read when you're trying to interpret Chinese law and what's going on in, in Chinese actions. The constitutional structure, as you will quickly find if you deal with it, is a unitary state. In other words, it's not a federalized country like Canada or the United States or Germany. There's one central government, uh, but there are also provincial people's congresses and provincial governors. The mountains are high and the emperor are far away. It's one of the more interesting tensions in the development, in, in the administration of China. There are some other important features. Much discussed has been a constitutional amendment in 1995, the Ifa Jigo, which because of the problems of translation from Chinese to English can have a couple of interpretations. And they're there in English and they mean different things. My interpretation of what was being done and where does Ifa Jiguo get used is Ifa Jiguo is used to overcome the problems of Shanggao Huangdi Yuan or the mountains are high and the emperor is far away. And what they're trying to say is when we pass a law in Beijing, it applies to you in the provinces. Now, the problem with reform and opening up, Gai Gai Kai Fang, the phrase that came out of Deng Xiaoping's Southern Tour, is that it's not a direct process. Reform also means, uh, in Chinese, innovation. And there are problems with that. You try things out and then you shift. And so you get another saying from Deng, Deng Xiaoping that is perhaps not quite as famous is that reform and opening up is not a direct process. It's mo zhe shi to guo he, to cross the river by feeling for the stones. And so you actually have laws in China that are labeled trial or we're trying this law out to see if it works. Um, they have had a legal system. They be in the turn of the century, 
for a variety of reasons, European powers would not allow uh, Chinese law to apply to European citizens. The Americans were the same. So as it went on, the Qing dynasty, represented by the Emperor Sisi, uh, pictured here in the only pictures that exist of a ruler from the Qing dynasty, realized things had to change. Um, she realized it too late. It was, the rock was a little deep and in 1911 the system fell. But the original idea of, of using Chinese and uh, the German civil code comes from that time. And in fact, if you look at the uh, civil code that's currently used in on the island of Taiwan, it's the same, it's from Germany. And they've now, as of, uh, I think it's May, if I remember correctly, they've adopted a new full civil code for China that will come into effect January 1st, 2021. The system is uh, in rule of law is developing. So to answer the first question, the basic advice is here. As I'll talk about in more detail later, China, China has IP laws that meet international standards. They've been working on that for a while. They have a legal system uh, copied from Germany, but that meets international standards. The courts do enforce the IP rights, and in particular, the IP rights held by foreign parties. But there are problems, and, and that's what I was talking about with the nation of counterfeiters. What you do is you combine it, and to a large extent, the threat to IP from counterfeiters can be costed and managed. And that's bolded there because that is the central message that I'm trying to get across. You know, if you want to take one takeaway is you want to say, okay, I've got IP, what am I going to do about it? I've had clients come to me and I say, nope, on what you've told me, I need this to protect it in China. The client says, I can't give you that. Okay, you're going to have to come up with another model for selling this product in China. We did, they, they, they did well. So one of the things that you, we want to look at is, so how do you cost and manage uh, the counterfeiting problem? Well, you have to look at the court system and get some ideas on how you do it. And here's a basic one that uh, I find very useful. Uh, it's the uh, World Bank and all its members, it surveys all its members and it keeps track of the cost of going to court to enforce a contract. Not the same as IP, but it's a good measure. And over the years, it's been reliably consistent and you see the rankings there. The top three, yeah, I, 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 you know, surveys aren't that precise. Canada, hey, they moved up from 112th. Canada has a problem with the slowness and the effectiveness of its court system and it's down below the, the midpoint in the members of the World Bank on the enforcement of contracts. So it's, I'd rather be in a Chinese court than a Canadian one. It's faster and it's cheaper. Well, is it any good? That's a thing you need to look at. Well, so read the cases. Um, the, China has been building a system of having cases online. It first started doing this with intellectual property cases. They were way ahead of everybody else. That's the point I'm trying to make, that they care about that. And they're online, so the judges know they're online, and the judges also have their own private system. And for years, the judges have been looking around to try and make sure that their decisions match with, with what has gone before. And in fact, now in uh, last, last month, the Supreme People's Court issued guidelines on how they're supposed to do that. You have to remember, it is, it is true that in civil law systems, they don't base their decisions on precedent as we do in Canada. However, they do pay a huge attention to deciding similar cases in a similar way 
and they do look at the cases. The judges really do that. I've been, I've known it for years because I talked to the judges and they would tell me. And their relative, you know, surveys have been done. Uh, maybe state-owned enterprises have uh, special privileges. Well, not that it's easy to find. Judges are influenced uh, by national policy positions. I think judges in Canada are influenced by national poli uh, policy positions as well. But you, China has a system that does relatively well. And there's, by the way, just a courtroom uh, to give you an idea of what uh, things look like. They usually hear things. That, that's Beijing number one intermediate people's court and it's deciding the first uh, anti-monopoly law case uh, where it reached a decision. They're reading out the decision. Um, so the next thing you want to look at if you're going to cost it and manage the protection of IP or how do you win in Chinese courts? And you have to, there's two real elements that are important. One is that you develop a strategy. You know what law is going to be infringed and how you're going to get there. And that is something where it's important that there be communication between the foreign lawyer and the Chinese lawyer. And that good communication is deeply important in understanding because it's quite different. And if the foreign lawyer just says, oh, I assume it's the same, so we do it like this, it doesn't work. The next big one is you have to collect the evidence. And that is one of the tough ones. Generally, civil law countries, including Germany, France, Italy, Spain, they do not have what we would describe as discovery. Each party is responsible for collecting their own evidence. And generally, the evidence needs to be authenticated by a third party. They have little, re the courts in civil law systems and in China have little regard for self-made evidence. You collect it also before you file the statement of claim. Different strategy than what you do in China. Now here, just for some pictures, here is a design patent enforcement case by a German company that designed a bus. And you can see the pictures in front of you, that's there. The woman and the man that are in uniform are judges. And the lawyer for one of the sides is over to the right of the, to the, sorry, left of the woman. He's got a suit and tie on and a technical expert is in the shirt, uh, the polo shirt with the brown stripes. But they're literally going out there. So what's behind them that they're seeking the shade of uh, on a hot summer's day? the evidence. In order to bring this case forward that they had infringed the design, the German bus company went out and bought a bus and had a notary verify that that's what had been done. So one thing that's not important is oral advocacy. An ordinary trial is only several hours. That's generous. I've been through them in 20 minutes. Oral testimony, you're allowed. It's actually very rare. Self-made evidence doesn't get a lot. So what do you do to collect the evidence? Well, what we call due diligence or investigations is actually quite good in China if you read Chinese. Um, there's a lot of information. Uh, the corporate social credit system, you can find out who is on the other side. Yeah, but there's a condition. The Chinese government only keeps its records in Chinese characters. It doesn't keep them. So if you have a signature from Tony Wang, you got nothing. And generally that is a problem with the names of the corporations as well. You need to know how it's done. And there's a big difference between having a Chinese character name and starting with something in English. Who is Again, China has adopted the civil law system where um, there is one person who signs for the company. It's known as the Fa Ding Dai Biao Ren. And that's the person you really want to identify because anybody who signs for the company has to have that, be that person or have their authority. 
You can also search, and this is one of the beauties of the Chinese system, is you can find out who the shareholders are connected to. How many other country, uh, companies do they have? You can search the address and find out whether it's a, uh, an apartment building, uh, an empty field, or other things. And with the resellers that we get, you know, we tend to do enforcement, prefer to do enforcements against factory because it works. But sometimes you do resellers and brokers. And there are more records that you can get. It's really often just a problem of how much do you want to pay for my one of my team to look all this stuff up and uh, read it in Chinese and then summarize it for you in English. So you, as I mentioned before, you collect the evidence before filing the statement of claim and you use a notary. Online evidence should be done in China, not over here. Physical evidence, first you go and locate it and then you have to book a notary. It's very different from the use of notaries in Canada. It does cost money. That is one of the factors that is not quite properly factored into the cost of, do, of doing a case in China because it's done before the statement of claim is filed. And then you have to, so finding the factory. There's Chinese, I'm going to show you something about finding a factory now that is one of our, one we're really proud of. It was very successful. It, it's been to court and uh, what we got is that a small business in the United States, they get awards as exporters from the Small Business Administration in the United States, went to a trade show and displayed their products. But before they did, they had filed a design patent both in the United States and in China, thank God. And then somebody at the trade show was tweeting around or passing stuff around and they were showing a, somebody who said, oh, I'll have a copy of that. I like that. I have, have a copy of that product out pretty soon. We didn't even have a correct name, let alone have a name we were confident in, in Chinese. Well, we did some work, some of it in my office here in Toronto and some of it in Beijing with a firm that we work with constantly We've been working with again over a decade. And we found something in this village and I'm going to show you. There's the village. Uh, it's south of the Yangtze between Nanjing and Suzhou and Suzhou is not that far from Shanghai to give you an idea where this is. And then we went looking at their corporate stuff and guess what? They weren't where their corporate address was recorded in the government records. And then we went, finally we were talking to the guy and we uh, found a way to talk him into trusting us enough. This is the Beijing office. And they led him down this unnamed street on the south side of the village I showed you to an unnumbered entrance and uh, into what essentially seemed to be more of a barn than a factory. And there's the inside of it and the products are all in the boxes. So that's one way of doing it. It's tricky. The search there was more expensive than usual because we didn't have Chinese characters, but we were successful. It went to trial. We won higher than average damages the other side's appealing. I don't give them much of a chance. Because of stuff like that, more sophisticated factories have become quite careful. And we have one that has an extensive business of their own, but they do some counterfeiting on, this, on the side, but they only do it internationally. We've tried approaching them in China. They don't talk to us. Uh, shall we say, respond to subtle inquiries to buy interesting product. And then they send stuff to our dealers with catalogs of infringing product, our product, stuff that copies us. And so we decided to do, in this case, a sting or a trap buy out of Bangkok because that was the dealer they were bothering the most. 
Ooh, then you've got some problems to debate. Will the evidence work? Are the notarial rules similar enough? Well, as we found out later, uh, despite hiring a Thai lawyer, Thailand does not have a, a, a law re governing notarization. That led to some problems. Notarization in Canada is different from notarization in China and the judges are starting to catch on to the difference. So that's some of the problems. Um, you have to convince them that they've got it. And one of the most important things is the bottom line there. You hope they will ship you a catalog with infringing products in it. You don't ask for the infringing products because then they'll plead that you induced them to break your law, to infringe your, your IP rights. It was a trap. So we got that and sure enough, we got the infringing products. So we made up an order and making paying attention to how much our client could afford and uh, because we knew that we weren't going to pay for the whole load or we might have to pay for the whole load down the road or something, but some money was going to disappear here into the other side. And we pay, negotiated the deposit amount down so that it was pretty good. And then the key is in the middle. Place, we insisted on having an inspection in China before the goods were loaded on a ship to go to Bangkok. Well, who do you think showed up at the inspection? The technical people? Nah, the notary. And where did the notary go <laughs> afterwards? They are, I, I, like it was the next day or the day after, my guy, our, our lawyers and the notary showed up in court, showed them the evidence they had, and the court seized the evidence before it ever got on the ship, at which point the infringer that had this other good business just hit the roof. They realized they'd been caught in a trap. There are problems and details in how you do this, and I've got some of it there, um, but you can, it, it, it is a way to deal with the problem of getting the evidence when you do not have the right to insist that the other party disclose it to you in discovery. People have often asked me, um, <clears throat> how, do, um, how do the Chinese courts treat foreigners? And this is one of a case, a case that I think is useful on summarizing that idea. Uh, you firstly, you know the parties. There's a Chinese party, Zhejiang uh, Blue Wild Liquor Company, and then Shanghai Pepsi Cola. And there's the ad that was the problem. Because if you, the Chinese is a bit hard to read there, but it's Lan Feng Bao, or Blue Storm. So here's the timeline. The Chinese had long applied the Chinese company had correctly applied for the trademark in that manner. Before it was registered, but it's still available on Chinese searches, very easy to discover. Pepsi decided to use it as part of a promotional campaign. The JJ and company said, uh, whatever. They were doing beer actually, not that. But the problem was they found that officials were seizing their products and dealers wouldn't take their products because they assumed that the products were infringing Pepsi's rights. So they, the, the Chinese company said, well, Pepsi's got to stop that campaign. Pepsi actually won on the first instance by saying that wasn't a trademark. I, I just don't buy it. I think that's something where they got away with it. On appeal, the court finally got it right. Pepsi had not properly cleared the mark for use. Now, we're going to run quickly through some, uh, basically, what are the trademark laws? And I talked about China working to, um, to improve its system. And uh, one of the things you see there is how often they've done trademark amendments. Canada did... Uh, when Stephen Harper was the prime minister in 2014, 
also did trademark amendments. They only came into effect last June, uh, a year ago last June. And the trademark office in Canada is still suffering while they're trying to get it right. China had it in, they had their system crash, their computer system for registering trademarks, and they fixed it. And they're on to the next set of amendments, as I described, which is the new amendment to Article 4 in bad faith. Very useful article. One of the key ones is, so when do you file your trademark? And the answer is now. There is a problem with squatters. Remember what I told you about a nation of counterfeiters in the United States or anywhere? There are ways of overcoming it. It's a first to file jurisdiction. What do you do? We prefer national applications, but we can, you can do Madrid. It's good to do clearance searches because I've actually, for actually an American client, I said, look, you're going to get this. It's a bona fide Chinese company, and that's going to be cited against you. And I said, however, if you change and add a whole bunch of design elements, you'll probably make it. And that is exactly what happened. It was cited against, refused, appealed, we won, and they got their mark registered. The Chinese subclassification system is, oh boy, that's a long story, but that's something you have to be uh, prepared to deal with. And the problem with the Madrid application is when the Madrid application arrives in Beijing, somebody takes your application and translates the description of wares and services into Chinese and allocates it to the subclasses at their discretion. Not such a good idea because you want to do that strategically yourself to avoid other marks that might be cited against you. The costs are about the same as, uh, say, using us, and you, the costs are all over the map. It's about the same as uh, doing a trademark uh, application and registration in Canada. Copyright law uh, has not quite had the same number of amendments. They started quite a while ago, and quite an internal Chinese dispute developed over uh, between users and of course the authors or creators. And it's still, they're still working on it, but it's pretty close. But the key thing for copyright protection, and we use it a lot, is that your protection in China arises automatically by treaty. So you can beat the trademark first to file system if you have enough creativity or originality, they, as they describe it, in your logo. On the word mark, useless. But on the logo, if you can do it, then you can show that, oh, you used it easier, you have a copyright there. Article 332 of the trademark law will allow you to block, to get rid of, to invalidate the registration of your trademark by the squatter. Um, there are, are problems in that if we've had squatters that have registered trademarks and we have to go to court to get rid of it and it is a bit more expensive to file because uh, you need to think about the chain of titles. So many small businesses on who may be in the audience, you, who did your logo? It was probably an independent contractor an artist that was an independent contractor, did you get a written assignment from that artist giving you the thing? Probably you just got a bill and you paid the bill and you forgot about it. And did you get it notarized? <laughs> so we go back to whoever created these, some of these logos and we start asking them, uh, you know, will you sign an affidavit that we can present in China? That's what drives the cost up. Patent law, there's a number of uh, types. Uh, I'm gonna run through this quickly because I notice that I know Laura wants me to let you ask questions. And uh, for design patents, remember that bus was a design patent issue. It's, in other words, it was the design of the bus and the way things were put together that was the item that was protected. And in fact, the bus company 
uh, the German bus company ultimately lost on appeal. Why? Because they found evidence in a, uh, in a trade magazine in Germany where they'd published the picture of the bus before they'd filed in China. And that's a major, we gotta watch that. When we have clients that we do design patents or design patent cases for, that, that is a big issue. Um, for patents themselves, China has become essentially easier. The biggest problem is the cost of the translation and checking it because mistakes in translation can invalidate your patent. But there's been a lot of debate and in Europe, you still have problems with software patent applications and it's been made easier in China. The examinations are getting faster, but the China, like having a higher standard of originality for copyright also has a higher standard for obviousness they tend to protect the public interest a bit more. Patents also have a very high win rate. It varies, it's about 80%. But is that accurate? Because so many are afraid to go to court, it may be only the best cases are being selected. Trade secrets, this is the tough part in China and it's because of court procedures as I once explained to the US government. They had me do a presentation down there, not under the current administration. And they have a broader definition of trade secrets than the Americans do in China. The tricks are the burden of proof because remember, as I told you earlier, you don't have discovery where you can force the other side to give you the evidence. So Another way of doing that, there are a number of ways in which you can overcome that. And, and uh, one of them is to use an NDA. Another one is to have an online document room. And we had a client that was quite big and international in the semiconductor chip area. And they said, oh yeah, we have one of those that we run ourselves. And I said, that's no good. And they went, why? Because you control it and therefore it's self-made evidence. You want a third party to run your document room. And then the other thing, you, if you look at my, my notes there, you'll see that you have to know how to sign a contract. An NDA is a contract. Well, you have to have the name of the Chinese characters and the name of the Chinese party and Chinese characters. You must know that it's the person who has the authority to sign. Usually it's done with a, a gong tong, a chop or a seal. If you're going to enforce it, uh, China doesn't enforce foreign judgments quite yet. There are changes coming, but you really, it's easier to use the Chinese court. It's faster and cheaper. And therefore you should also have a bilingual agreement with initials on it to show that it's ready to go. And so if you are a contract, these are some of the things. Uh, the old contract law served very well. It's now largely been put into the new civil code. Um, but Chinese judges actually tend to hold parties to their contracts more than what we find in North America. They're less sympathetic to, oh, he tricked me or he committed fraud or something like that. Um, It can be in English only, but if you really want the parties that are going to read your contract to understand what they're supposed to do, they should be reading it in Chinese. Arbitration awards have problems. They cost more, they take longer, and the enforcement rate is about 70-80%. It's pretty good, which is not a bad enforcement rate, but that means you win in the arbitration and then you go to China and then you've got another trial again to get the Chinese court to enforce your award. Planning for enforcement as we're coming to the end here. Um, I'm just trying to give you some examples of things that I've had to look at where the client's gone ahead and may not have done it well and we got to fix the mess. And uh, so you use the exclusive jurisdiction of the New York courts. That means you can't use the Beijing courts. 
If you get a New York judgment, you can't enforce it in Beijing. Then we have ones where they use the name of the uh, Chinese party in English only, or even in pinyin. Remember, pinyin cannot be reversed into characters with certainty. <laughs> There's another problem. And then we've seen, oh yes, our friend in China translated it for us. Yeah, but did you read it? Uh, anyhow, uh, no seals. How do you prove the person had authority? Was it registered with the appropriate government authority? What do you do? You correctly identify the party by getting a copy of a business license. That's not, like that's the equivalent of the Articles of Incorporation in Canada. And that's not what you would do here. It would almost be like challenging somebody's uh, truthfulness. I've actually walked past a menswear store in a, in a mall in a third tier city in China and they had their business license out there front in a glass stand on display. What they were trying to say is we're, this is who we are and we're an honest dealer. Very common. The corporate ID numbers, that's another way. You initial, what you commonly do with Chinese contracts in China, you fan out the pages and put the chop on. So what is the conclusion? Um, China supports IP. I, I've never known it otherwise in, in all the time I've been doing it. And I didn't start litigation until it's a couple of decades of this. I, I started litigation later when I got more comfortable. IP rights are enforceable. We do it all the time. We collect money. That trap buy we're talking about, we got 70,000, we settled for 70,000 US. I think it was worth more, but you know, it's my client who makes those decisions. Contracts are enforceable. Yes, it's a wild west economy. It means you have to do greater due diligence, both in checking out your partners in advance, and it's a lot easier in China than it is in Canada, and in uh, taking precautions, registering your IP. That is absolutely important. You register your IP in China. Yeah, there are some standards where there's more public interest in, in it, and I could explain that in greater detail, but that's the basic uh, basic rundown here. So I think, uh, Laura, do we have questions? Yeah, well, I, I think they'll start coming in. Um, I think um, Paul's a really fabulous presentation, and um, I think that uh, the questions will be coming in very soon. Um, but I, I just want to ask you, um, you know, just, you know, you talked a bit about uh, you talked a bit about notaries and, and the costing. You were, you were quite upfront about that. Um, so what, will, what does it look like in terms of a price of a, of a notary? Uh, it's usually about 3,000 US. And okay. it can be more, it can be less, depends how much work they have to do. Uh, but that's a reasonable, you know, if you're looking for a number. Uh, going to trial in China, we generally tell people it's now around uh, $25,000. Well, you know, the Canadian numbers are more like 100 to 200,000. Wow. Okay. That, that's sobering. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, China's cheaper. And uh, it's also faster. Uh, China's about six months uh, to get a decision. We've had longer. Uh, patent cases generally take longer. Uh, patent invention patents and they're more expensive. Uh, but, you know, just an ordinary contract case. I had one that uh, we filed, I think it's October the 24th, and we had our decision before the end of the year. That's it amazing. Was, yeah, no, it was fast. It was actually a little too fast. And we appealed it to the Beijing Higher People's Court, which is the second highest court in China. And then we got what we wanted. Now that took a bit of time because judges in China are allowed to mediate and we chose to mediate. And it helped us a great deal. The other side wouldn't agree to our terms. We thought they were reasonable. And the judge just gave us our last position. And upped, and upped the damage award. 
because we, we you don't make money on litigation in China like you might in some other countries. So we don't usually push very hard in trying to claim damages. It costs right. a lot more to give the evidence. And Paul, do you find you have a lot of SMEs, small companies that come to you, or are they what's what's the kind of your a regular client in your world? We. Um, there's more on the medium than the small, but it depends on how you define it. But we, we do have some smaller ones. We also have uh, multinationals who've been in China for quite a while and are just starting to realize that their portfolio isn't what they thought it was. Uh, we have one that's extremely well known, uh, but the squatter filed in 1999. They filed earlier than that, but they didn't pick up on the squatter for two decades. Did they know about the squatter or did they just... You don't know. Was... They're still waiting to come back on that. But what happened is eventually they sold a new line. They extended their product line slightly. And uh, then the squatter sent a cease and desist letter saying, you know, stop doing this. I own the mark and we yeah. looked. And they did own the mark. And we're not sure where we're going to go next on that. They've got to come back to us and say, what do you want to do? Did you know about this? Uh, I have a feeling they may not have. The decisions were made uh, quite a few years ago to leave it alone or something like that. But I, we're, we're yet to see. But we have smaller ones too. I mean, well, I guess as I pointed out, that one we did where I showed the, the trip down the farm room. Yeah. In the United States, that's a small uh, business administration firm. And in fact, when I just today I checked, uh, their building in near New Orleans is about the same size as the building I showed you in China. They're not that big. Yeah, right. Well, they, I guess for a reason. They want to be, they don't want to just show. They don't want to be up here. They're, they're, they're sort of laying under in, in incognito, I guess, for a purpose. Well, you, uh, it's a small, we have small business clients, is what I was trying to, to, right. to say. And, and this, that one was a small, that uh, thing, it was an uh, aftermarket auto part. It, it's a small business. And the part, one of the things about that one was that um, the part was easy to duplicate, very easy. And we warned them and said, look, we take this one out, there'll be probably be another one come along. And they mm -hmm. said, yeah, we understand, but we want to do it. I think the little incident at the trade show had really made them mad. And we gave them numbers and our numbers were pretty accurate as to what things were going to go, except for the search. Finding them was a little tougher than we expected. I think it was in the, you know, what am I talking about? Well, you know, Mickey Mouse due diligence is about 2000. I think we spent closer to 10 on that one because we had to do an awful lot more. They did not even, mm -hmm. they didn't even know for sure the name in English, let alone in Chinese. Yeah, no, it's interesting. And, and you know, you talk even about pinyin because pinyin can't be an exact translation. Um, it's hard to, to track down the actual characters. Um, Paul, I wanted to ask you also, you talked about um, Madrid application versus national application. Can you tell me a bit about what, why is Madrid preferred and just a little quick sort of answer what, what that's all about, what's the difference? Okay. In the revisions to the law, the, uh, that Canada did recently, Canada agreed to be part of uh, to what's known as the Madrid Protocol. And in Madrid, you're allowed to take your Canadian application and send it to uh, Geneva, and they'll send it to all the offices you choose and pay for. But they send the Canadian application. They don't modify it for China or Russia or Germany. And each office has different rules. So it's intended to be an easier way to uh, do broader protection. And in some instances it can work. But for a lot of reasons, if you look at the refusal rate of China or the refusal rate for Americans going into the US, 
they have different systems. And the refusal, refusal, Madrid refusal rate is very high. So what we recommend is no, search, see if you have problems. Then maybe we work around those problems by the way we describe your wares and which Chinese subclasses we make the application. And then we change the design. I said, don't apply for that mark, apply for this one, which had a lot of design elements in it and was bigger. So Madrid is this international system and it works where you've got a large number of countries or a large number of marks. Some of them get through and some don't and you're better off and it's cheap. If you really want that mark protected in China, you do a national application. Excellent. It's your key mark, you know, and you're going into China and you're not other countries, do a national application. Very good advice, Paul. Um, I do have a question um, from the audience. Uh, if the agreement is governed by the law of Hong Kong and arbitration uh, is by Singapore International Arbitration Center, can the case be taken to the court in China? Well, you've already agreed to arbitrate. Presumably, and, and it goes to the wording of the agreement as to whether you can go to a court. So having agreed to arbitrate and having agreed to a particular uh, arbitration setting, you're, by Chinese court would say you're stuck with it. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, I wanted to ask you to, you talked about logos and I'm, for an SME, you know, you're spending money on a logo, your branding. I wouldn't normally have, have thought about that. You talk about having it um, notarized. Can you tell me, like, can you tell me a little bit about that? And is it your advice to get it, get that done no matter what? Um, well, it, it is a big advantage in the whole process. Um, a huge advantage because the copyright protection extends immediately to the other country. So say you've got a small business here and they've started up and they've got a nice product, a lobster or something, Boston lobster, and because uh, that's what the Chinese call our lobsters. Mm -hmm. And you, uh, uh, you, you do the logo and you have an artist who's, who's done it for you. The rule in Canada is that you don't own the copyright in that design unless there are words on paper that the copyright was assigned to you, okay? And while you've got instant protection from, or at least your designer does in China because of the Berlin Treaty, which will be recognized in a Chinese court. I've read it being recognized. You don't even necessarily own it. And Gosh. that's a common problem. That's you don't even own it in camp. Right. So you need to get a good assignment. And then why do you need notarization? Because um, the rule in a Chinese, in Chinese rules of evidence say that all foreign evidence, evidence coming from outside China has to be notarized and legalized and that takes time and money. We spend a lot of time and money doing it for our clients, unfortunately, but it's a problem around the world. It's not a specific Chinese problem. Right, right. Paul, um, we're getting close to the end here and uh, I mean, I could go on forever. I think it's, I have a million questions, but we'll have you, I'm sure back on again, uh, it's just fascinating um, what, what you're doing. And um, it's, it's eye-opening, I think. A lot of, there's a lot of myth busters, I think, in your presentation. And I think, like you said, the overall takeaway is uh, don't let IP get in the way of, of taking on the China market. So um, while I just want to say thank you very, very much again and uh, really appreciate your sponsorship, um, I would like to just invite Yixian Chen, uh, associate with your team, uh, to share with us a little bit about your services and see, you know, how anyone who's listening in maybe can get your, your help. Thank you, Laura. 
Um, good afternoon. My name is Yishan Chen. I'm an associate working with Paul and, at Johnson Company. Um, we are a multilingual firm in Toronto, specializing in intellectual property, licensing, franchising, and international law. Uh, we regularly provide legal advice to businesses on the protection of IP rights and distribution of their goods and services in China, Canada, and Russia, and internationally. All the colleagues in our firm have received both civil law and common law legal trainings in China or Russia and Canada. I am the main person at our firm who handles outbound work related to IP protection and enforcement in China and other Asian countries. Um, I am born and raised in Chongqing, China and completed my first law degree and legal training in China. Then I studied law in Germany and came to Canada to further pursue my legal career and obtained a qualification to practice law in Ontario. Together with our colleagues, and our local agents, I help clients develop IP filing and prosecution strategy, pursue cases um, through all levels of China's system, from China IP administration to Chinese courts, and combat counterfeiters and infringers, both online and through civil or administrative actions. With Po and another colleague, we attend conferences in China annually and learn about the latest development in law and legal practice and maintain a seamless work relationship with our Chinese local agents. Um, as Paul mentioned earlier, China has a unique IP law and procedures. Uh, the system is familiar to us and we have personal contact and knowledge of people working in the court system. We believe that uh, the understanding um, of cultural differences in both common law and civil law system is the key to provide clients with tailored legal services for their business developments in China. Thank you. Cecia Isian. And uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks, Paul, to, and thanks to everyone who joined us today. Uh, it's a great session. Um, so be sure to sign up uh, for this, our final webinar uh, in the China Ready series on August 26th, uh, where we'll, uh, we've invited Alibaba Group to present on the topic of e-commerce, selling your product in China without having to jump on a plane. Uh, in this session, Alibaba Group will introduce a complete suite of solutions for brands and retailers to engage with Chinese consumers. And just another reminder for all of you who have uh, have carried on with us through these six sessions, you will be receiving a CCBC official China Ready certificate upon completion. So we thank you again uh, very much for joining us today and uh, wishing you all a, a wonderful weekend and we'll see you again next week.